Good evening. Good that we can assemble in the house of God on this Wednesday evening. Despite everything that's going on, it just seems to be so crazy at times. It just, uh, I reckon with the events of the last couple of days that just, uh, that Galen had kind of talked about, just uh, kind of reading part right into this message here. Um, if you've got your Bibles, turn them to the book of Obadiah. We're going to look at the vision that Obadiah had that was given to him by the Lord God. It is uh, coming out of the book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 19, brought a comment about Edom. And that verse reads this way, Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. If you are at Obadiah now, hold them up high for me. The table is spread, the master calleth, come and dine. We're going to look at the first nine verses this little book of Obadiah is broke down into two main points. The first one being Edom's destruction. And you can see, we'll see that and study that through the first 16 verses. And then the balance of this single chapter book, Israel's restoration. So let's get in and read our nine verses and we will get into our topic tonight. The vision of Obadiah Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Timon, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight, Lord. We just desire to get into your word, Lord. You have set the table the food is there and ready to go for us, Lord. We just ask that to let the Holy Spirit speak boldly tonight through your servant, Lord. Let your word ring true. Lord, most of all, do not let my nerves get in the way of what you have to say. Let those that are here receive your word in a fashion that they can understand how I received it, Lord. We're trusting in you. We ask all of this in Jesus' blessed and holy name. Amen. Now, by way of introduction, as I said, Edom, uh, this book is broke down into two parts. The destruction of Edom and Israel's restoration. But these first nine verses are the charges that have been placed upon Edom. So we see right off the bat in verse 1, we not only get the definition of of who is bringing this message, but it also identifies how he received it in the first four words, the vision of Obadiah. And who gave him the vision? 
It goes on to say, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. The interesting thing about our writer here is there are four uh, prophets in the Old Testament that we are given very little information about. And sometimes that's a good thing. A lot of times if you've got someone that's all high and mighty and they've got a whole lot of background, then you kind of focus on their background and not on the message. So we're going to keep it simple and sweet. Obadiah, his name means servant of Jehovah. You don't need to know much more than he serves the Lord our God. But knowing that he's serving, I think, I think that's where we all want to be able to say when someone looks at us is that that's a servant of God. Our prophet is given insight to share about God's judgment on Edom. But where is this Edom that we're talking about through these nine verses? Well, this land, this mountain range was the, to the southeast of Judah and Judea. Uh, we see a people of the people of Edom will kind of need to kind of journey back just a little bit to kind of get a better understanding. We kind of been given a little bit of insight already just in the simple fact that in our scripture verses that Esau, the brother of Jacob, the son of Isaac and Rebekah has been brought up. So we kind of have a little bit of an understanding, but let's, let's kind of take it just a little bit further back in. Genesis chapter 25, we kind of need to establish where Esau got his name, and not only that, where he then became Edom. We see in verse 25, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Red and hairy. That's kind of peculiar, but there's a, there's, a, there's a lesson in there for us, but let's kind of continue going on. If you jump down to verse 30, we see the other half of his namesake. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Now, Edom would find himself in his journey and would start the Edomites in the Mount Seir. And you can see that after he journeys back to Mount Seir, after he has met back up with Jacob. And we're gonna talk about that also. But let's kind of get in just a little bit on these two boys just right quick here. Um, Isaac, back in verse 21, he entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. It almost seems kind of interesting to look back that his father had to have, father and mother had to have faith in the Lord to receive him. So there's Abram, nearly a hundred year old, when he finally gets to see the son of promise. And we see Isaac here having that same situation going, my father is supposed to be a father of many nations. But here I am, his son, and I have no sibling, and I have no children of my own. But here we are. Um, he has entreated the Lord. Verse 22, and the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, I'd like to think that one of the things that you ladies have a tendency to do is when someone's pregnant, you kind of go through and you discuss how pregnancies went for you and instead, and the things that you, the food that you may have craved and whatnot and, or uh, pains that you dealt with. That first time the little child kicked with inside your womb, all of these things. So you share this and these uh, young ladies that are coming up and that are now pregnant, they have that understanding of what they're getting into. And she kind of, in her body, she's saying, this feels different than the way anyone's explained it. Beautiful thing is, that rather than going to Dr. Spock or some magazine for family health, she, what's it, uh, what does she do in verse, uh, there at the end of verse 22? 
and she went to inquire of the Lord. She went to prayer for the child of her womb, and he, she's getting ready to find out what's going on. And the Lord said unto her there in verse 23, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, how many of us are the older sibling? So, so several of us are the younger sibling. All righty. Well, I know since I'm the oldest one, I'm kind of looking at that phrase, serve the younger one. I love my brother, but I don't know that I'm ready to be a servant to him. But that's one of the things that we kind of have a drawback in this. Said families just have a tendency not to get along, especially when the kids are growing up. There's always going to be a fight between them, whether it's two brothers, two sisters, or for that matter, a brother and a sister. Scripture kind of tells us about some other boys that couldn't manage to get along. In Genesis chapter 4, we see the encounter of Cain and Abel. Now, Cain, he brought what he brought his first fruits, but it was the first fruits of the hand of his work. Abel brought the first fruits of the sheep, of the lambs. He brought a proper sacrifice. What happened to old Cain? Cain got mad. Who did he get mad at? He got mad at his brother. His brother didn't do anything wrong. There was a sacrifice that needed to be made. There was an atonement that needed to be addressed. And I am most certain that both boys knew exactly what that was to be and how that needed to be taken care of. But instead, what do we see? We see brother going against brother in a field. One walked away and the blood of the other cried from the rocks. We go on and we look at the two boys that would be born of Abram, Ishmael and Isaac. The first one, Ishmael, would be identified, God identified that he would be a great nation, but he had also said that he would be a wild man. And then we've got Isaac. Now there was definitely a level of strife that took place between these two boys. And you can read that there in chapter 21, that uh, old Ishmael would look at his brother and how he'd respond and there'd be snickers and looks. Oh, Sarah said, that woman's got to go, her and her child. But God let him know he's going to be a great nation. But what do we see in the world today? Those two nations have strife. They're having struggles. They cannot commune together the way they need to. But here we are, we're talking about these two brothers. Esau and Jacob. Actually, we could take it just a step further. The two wives, not to let the ladies off the hook, Leah and Rachel had their fair share of quarrel because it was, Rachel couldn't have children right off the bat, but Leah gave him three sons, and finally it took, took a minute to get things going in the right order, so sisters had to strike. But we're talking right here about Esau and Jacob. And, well, actually, I got a note. When you look at the children of Israel, who were his beloved children? It was the babies of the bunch. And one of those babies found himself locked up in a jail in Egypt, but got victory in the end for the whole nation. All right, but right now here in Obadiah, we are talking about Edom, Esau. Obadiah's vision shows and says that an ambassador is sent among the heathen to gather them up, to rise up against Edom. Why? What did Edom do to bring judgment of this type upon themselves? We need to remember Esau and Jacob would become great nations, and the older was to serve the younger. What is the difference between the brothers? Self or flesh and salvation, relationship with God. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, 
and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Esau represents the flesh. Jacob represents the spirit. But we see here in uh, chapter 25 of Genesis that he came in hungry and was willing to sell his birthright. Was, he says, I, uh, Esau, he says, and Isaac uh, loved Esau, uh, and Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. Verse 30, and Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. How hungry was he? He wasn't to death. We go into the New Testament, we see that Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted, fasting, prayer. So how hungry was Esau? He didn't think a whole lot of that birthright. Birthright that he sold for pottage and bread was his right to that first relationship with God. He loved the work of his hands. And I, I got to admit, uh, when it comes to fishing, um, big fish in the boat, you're the man that stands tallest on the boat. Even if you're the shortest man on the boat, you still get to stand, stand the tallest. Um, same with hunting. If uh, you're out hunting and you get to take a picture of a nice big old buck, got a rack that's out, out like this, you're the man on top of the totem pole. So there's, there's something to say about that. So, so that, uh, that opportunity here, that, that first ride at things, Esau loved the work of his hands, so he enjoyed that. Sounds a lot like Cain, don't it? He brought the crops to the field. In Malachi chapter 1, we see God kind of open up just a little bit further on his opinion of Edom in the book of Malachi, which kind of changes up things just a little bit. In verse 2 of chapter 1, it says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. What's verse 3 start off with? And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. But we will return and build the desolate places, thus saith the Lord of hosts. They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall come, call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation. Wow. God hating Esau. When you think on that just for a moment, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow. Knowing God hates you. But why? Why? Now remember what we read in the book of Joel when we studied that in our verse 19 of chapter 3 said that they had shed innocent blood. So we need to look further into the crimes of Edom. The Edomites have been kin to Israel for quite a few years now. But when the nation of Israel came to the edge of the land, turn in your Bibles to the book of Numbers chapter 20, and we'll read there starting in verse 14. Edom said, you can't pass through our land. So let's take a closer look at that. Numbers chapter 20, verse 14 through 21. When you are there, say amen. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the travel that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel, 
and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right or to the left until we have passed thy borders. What does Edom say there in verse 18? And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with what? A sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway. And if I and my cattle drink of the water, thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only without do anything else go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. Wherefore Israel turned away from him. Does this look like brotherly love? Nope. Edom showed their strength and did still didn't want anything to do with Israel or God. This seems like Esau, who didn't receive his blessing from his father. Was Esau always like this? Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 33. We've got es uh, Esau is coming out to meet Jacob and his children and his uh, the concubine, his uh, cattle. And, but we see, we see an Esau that is definitely different. Now, Jacob struggled with meeting his brother, knowing full well that he's like, this may not end well for me. And they found himself wrestling with God the night before and would ever change him. Verse 4, And Esau, upon seeing Leah, Rachel, the children, as they had passed, he ran to meet him and embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Now this sounds like a brother that loves a brother. But why? Why do we end up with the result that we ended up with? Why does God say in Malachi, I hate Esau? Finishing up verse 2, for their strength and wisdom, God says, I have made thee small among the heathen. To see more, let's take a look at verse 3 just a little bit there. And that'll give us, go ahead and uh, say this first portion with me. We're going to read down to thee. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. What deceived them? Pride. What did God hate? Esau's pride. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, Solomon kind of identified some of the things that God has issue with. Starting in verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among who? Brethren, among the family. What was that first what was that first thing he hated? A proud look. I hate to almost ask this question, but uh, uh like I told Galen, I said the steel toed boots have had to be very comfortable upon my feet as I was going through this message. Church, 
Where is our heart today? Have we had any proud looks? Have we had any pride in our heart? Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13 goes on to say, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. What's that forward mouth? Habitually disposed to disobedience and opposition. Disobedience and opposition. That kind of almost sounds like the society that we've got today. This side's looking at this direction, telling the other side that they're wrong. This side over here is telling the other side that they're wrong. And who's meeting in the middle? Jesus waiting on both of them to get a brain. Unfortunately, apparently, we've just about given that away. So we can definitely say that we've seen some people. Well, actually, I wrote the question, any of that verse sound like some people you know? Before you answer yes, I had to look in the mirror. So I probably reckon to say we all kind of need to do that. We fall into that category. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says, For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father, but of the world, uh, is of the world. Where does pride come from? <laughs> when it comes from the old devil. It didn't take him long. In verse, verse three kind of gives us just a little, little more. We've got the, the rest of that verse goes on to kind of correlate with someone else. It said, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, what? Who shall bring me down to the ground? Where do they dwell in the clefts of the rocks? Their home was built in the rocks, or the rocks habitation high in a mountain city, that saith in his heart, what? Who shall bring me down? The city in question is Petra, a city built into the mountainside, one way in, one way out, nearly indestructible. So they thought. But I think I remember a few men back in 1912 in April that sent a ship off on its maiden voyage, April 15th. Those that built the Titanic uttered these great words, God himself could not sink this ship. Oh, the proud heart. What happened four days later? That ship split in two after hitting an iceberg and found itself at the bottom of the ocean. What a voyage, but what a way of loss. Nebuchadnezzar spoke with pride in his heart and found himself in insanity, eating grass and acting like the beast of the fields and you can read that for yourself in chapter 4, verses 30 through 32. It don't take much when we find pride getting in. Don't take long. You, uh, even from a pulpit, it can take place. You get a message that just seems to ring true, and you see hearts getting changed, and then all of a sudden the devil says, you've done a great job there. You've done a great job. What, a, what does that man of God got to do. He's like, whoa, 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 back up. That wasn't me. That was the Holy Spirit. Someone else, turn in your Bibles over to Isaiah chapter 14. Someone else had this much pride in his heart. We'll start at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to where? The ground. Which dost weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. 
I will be like who? The Most High. Oh, Lucifer, pride has delivered you to the bottomless pit as we studied in the book of Revelation. And where else will it find him? In the lake of fire, which is the second death. How can I correlate these, these two individuals? We see there in verse 3, they've got their, dwell, uh, they dwellest in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high. Verse 4, thou exaltest thyself as the eagle. The eagle is representation of deity, so representation of God. So they're saying they're, they're just as high and as important and, and as valuable as God. What's the rest of the verse 4 say? And though thou set thy nest, where? Among the stars. Where did Satan said, I will set my, I will set my throne above the, as, as the, in the stars. Thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. The devil said he'll set his throne where? In the heights um, of the Most High. Edom has said the same thing in their hearts. God will have his judgment. As we look at verses 5 through 9. If the thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Remember, one way in, one way out. You battle your way in. If the, if the line is long enough, you'll gain the victory. Because when you think you've got the unbreakable fortress, somebody's going to figure out how to do it. We read on down there in verse 7, all thy men of thy confederacy of thy union, all those people that you're sloshing in the bar with, those are the ones that are going to rob you blind. Those are going to be the ones that are going to take away everything. The men that were at, pe uh, that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread hath laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. God is putting everything on display. There is nothing that Edom is going to be able to hide. Their friends have already seen everything that Edom has got. Uh, one commentator identified that because of the type of city that this was, that other cities would bring their large quantities of gold and goods to keep them there with the notion that there's one way in, one way out. So it's pretty safe. But God's going to prove otherwise. What happens to people that think nothing will happen to them? Something's going to happen. Things they don't want happening to them. Brothers and sisters, the trials have begun. The thief comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. That's what John chapter 10 verse 10 says. The devil will put pride in your life in the blink of an eye. Flesh is carnal. And in order to win, we must not war against our brother and sister. Kind of like over at McDonald's. Somebody didn't make a Big Mac right. I think we kind of all got that figured out. I think we can all probably sing that song on how that sandwich is made better than we could sing the Ten Commandments. Two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. That's how simple that, that's pretty simple to think someone got shot or something like that. I'm not saying that's what happened, but if it was an employee and a customer, what could have brought that level of strife? What type of brotherly love are we dealing out? Verse 7, those that stood in the battle with them now have the knife. Where? In the back of Edom. As Icarus flew too close to the sun, so it is for us to have a humbled heart. In Micah chapter 6 verse 8, it reads, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, 
and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. That's all Esau had to do to keep the love of God upon him. But instead he saw the love of what his hands could do. When he shot his arrow, he probably was strong enough. He probably fought a few animals with his bare hands. David done a pretty good job taking care of a lion and a bear. So imagine someone strong like Esau. Wise men, where does our wisdom lie? Mighty men, where does your strength lie? In Psalm, Psalm chapter 20, we're almost done here. Verses 6 through 9. Now know that um, I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with saving strength in his, in his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of who? The Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. Where is our hope, brethren? If your hope is where it should be, trust in the one that is in control of this life. The Lord our God, El Shaddai. As you know, I called Galen tonight and wanted to switch prayer up just a little bit. I just ask that tonight, knowing the things that we've heard, not just in this lesson, but the things that we hear that are going on outside of our, of our nucleus here, I'll tell you what, just go ahead and start coming, and I'll finish reading, and then we can get into prayer. Search your heart for someone that needs healing, healing of life, healing from sin, sickness, and pride. Maybe that is you tonight. Come to the altar with a humble heart. Christ died for you and for me. He has been waiting at your heart's door and is knocking. Why? Because he loves you. He has forgiveness for you. Child, God is there for you. Haven't forgiven because maybe there's someone that you haven't for been, uh, that you haven't forgiven because they've hurt you physically or emotionally. It is time to release yourself from that pain. Let the pain of pride that is in your heart be resolved. The rest of John chapter 10, verse 10 finishes this way. I am come that they might have life and have that life more abundantly. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just give you praise, glory, and honor for, for what you have done for us, Lord. There are many people that are in our lives, Lord, that just need a touch from you. And it's not just sickness, Lord. There are those that are lost, Lord, and undone. They have heard the truth in, a, in such a mighty way, Lord, from, from different individuals, Lord. But they have been reluctant and resistant to the truth, Lord. We know that you stand at the door and knock. We just ask, Lord, place someone that can speak words of truth into their heart, Lord, that tonight they can see the victories that those of us that have already come to know you as Lord and Savior have. You have always been there waiting for us, Lord. The pride of this life and the pride that dwells in the hearts of individuals. We need to stand fast and not let the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes decide who we are, the directions that we go in life. Those that seemingly felt like maybe they was holding us back, Lord. There are those that have hurt us, Lord, that we struggle with. And we we're, we're just have the hatred and anger in our hearts. But we need to release that. And when we release that, Lord, the freedom, the joy that we get to have, the joy and peace that passes all understanding, Lord, 
We just glorify you, Lord, and know that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. We're trusting in you tonight, Lord, to do things that go beyond our understanding. We've got a great list of people that need you, Lord, and we're trusting and relying that your will will be done in such a mighty way, Lord. We just cannot thank you enough, Lord, for the things that have taken place. For members of this church, Lord, that, that are struggling with sickness, we put it in your hands, Lord. We know that this COVID, Lord, it just leaves a lasting effect on the body, Lord. It has been devised to steal the breath, the breath that you offered, the breath that you gave us, Lord. So we just are trusting you tonight, Lord, to do great things, to move as only you can, Lord. We have missionaries that'll be coming in, Lord. We just ask that you protect them in their, in their travels, Lord. Bring them here safe. We know the great distance that they are traveling, Lord. We glorify you that they can be here with us, Lord, at the appointed time. So we look forward to great things to come, Lord. We're also asking, Lord, that you move in such a way that revival begins, Lord, not just in this church, but in this neighborhood and in the neighborhoods around us, Lord. There is a revival that needs to take place. The hearts of people have so much hatred towards each other, Lord. We need to find and see the love that you have for us. Give us the insight and the understanding to be able to share that love, Lord. We just know that you're going to carry us safely home tonight, Lord. You'll bring us safely back once again on Sunday morning where we can gather as family, as brothers and sisters, not as enemies, but as family. We ask all of this in Jesus' gracious and heavenly name. Amen.